Thank you for that kind introduction and thanks for everyone's attention um, and thanks for the um, invitation to come and disseminate some of the findings we're seeing um, in a location that has access to Cabro Tegravir in terms of FDA approval and acquisition. So today's talk, um, the purpose of it was to look at how to um, go ahead and administer long-acting injectables, both for treatment and prevention in a setting that would promote de-medicalization. Um, um, kind of what the plenary was getting at uh, to, to address stigma and um, um, essentially um, de-medicalization and discrimination. And what was very interesting in the plenary, it was also brought up about the need for task shifting. And so um, the the kind of framework of this talk is one of the elements of how to administer it through task shifting, which then can allow all of us to um, essentially reach populations outside of the clinical setting, which will be a different shift for us because we're used to oral prep. And so that's a different, um, in terms of a structural context, that's very different in terms of medication distribution, um, having needles, syringes, disposals, et cetera. So I'm going to go ahead and um, provide a case model with my hat at Whitman Walker Health as a clinician there. And then that's going to go ahead and um, lead us into kind of the lessons learned from other um, uh, uh, topic areas and geographic areas where lay workers or medically um, unlicensed professionals but highly trained were able to deliver, deliver care with great competence and quality through, um, you know, great QA programs. And then in terms of kind of a push forward and a call to action for us as, as a scientific community and advocacy community on how to go ahead and, um, you know, create the policies we need for the next two decades in order to foster task shifting in the era of injectables. So turning on um, my clinician hat and medical director hat of pre-exposure prophylaxis, Whitman Walker Health is based in DC. There's um, two sites. You can see um, there's a very col colorful building that is in inviting. It's very different than a traditional medical clinic. And then we've got a mobile van that extends and gives um, free STI testing and treatment as well as um, HIV testing and counseling and linkage to um, the status neutral continuum. And what was what's very important is Whitman Walker is a large volume clinic. It's a government clinic. Um, it sees over 16,000 people a year, has over um, 150 um, clinical visits. And so nestled in this large federally qualified health center in a large city that has, um, as part of the ending the epidemic plan in America, there is a medical department and there's also a community health department. And this is very unique to the healthcare system and may actually lend itself to um, lessons learned and similarities to other places outside of the US. And so um, the community health department created a um, five person team where they have prep specialists. These are individuals who are not licensed practitioners in the United States through the DC health law. They're allowed to practice in the clinic and in places that are supervised by clinicians, which includes our mobile van, which is considered a clinical site, as well as um, the second floor of our clinic. And what's important is the job descriptions, et cetera, um, bode to hiring people from the community. We train them in prep follow-up visits, education on um, how to have, uh, how to optimize adherence to medications. And um, we, um, as a community, also um, strive to help them with retention. So these specialists um, have novel ways of SMS messaging, um, you know, reaching their clients to the phone, et cetera. Um, they're trained in phlebotomy for three days, and they actually do phlebotomy and rapid testing on site. And then they have um, same day to within 48 hour referral linkage within our large system to acute care, mental health, um, their primary care, et cetera. And so this clinic in general started um, since 2018 and um, basically served since 2018 over 1,200 people. And um, it, this last quarter of uh, 2022, it had 850 people. And the retention, when we looked at the medical clinic, the clinic overall has around um, 2,800 prep users. We saw in the orange bars on this slide, essentially you had consistent 
high retention among a peer-led clinic, but you also had um, consistently higher retention compared to a medical clinic, almost 20 points higher. Obviously, there's a selection bias in this clinic, but I wanted to give you the landscape of the clinic because now we turned into essentially every center in the United States and also in every country, we're looking at, we've got the status neutral continuum, it's turned into the virtual care continuum and the hybrid care continuum, and now we've got interventions a lot along each step of each side, the PrEP side and the HIV, preve um, the HIV prevention side and the HIV treatment side and the status neutral overall. But now how are we starting to implement the injectable care continuum? And I think that was a really great point at um, yesterday's implementation implementation science plenary and, and also um, during the opening plenary, it went, uh, it went to task shifting as, as a major issue. And part of the task shifting is because this is an every two month injection. It is administered by someone other than self. And very importantly, um, there's missed visits and there's window periods. And so in order to scale up as a community throughout the world, wherever you are, we're going to have to look at task shifting, which then can lend itself to demedicalization. And so Whitman Walker actually, from the get-go, task shifted. On the right-hand side, we have the HIV care continuum, and we have 20 medical assistants that are in clinic already. They give injections for um, syphilis treatment, gonorrhea treatment, vaccines, etc. They were slated to the HIV treatment side, Repivirin and Cabotegravir. But in order to not overwhelm our clinic, we then, on the HIV prevention side, decided to have Cabotegravir integrated and injected uh, into the PrEP clinic and administered by the PrEP specialist. And that's what I'm going to go into. And before I go into the Whitman Walker process and le lessons learned, I wanted to highlight there's a paper um, hot off the press in the Open Form Infectious Diseases by Emory University on um, the early experiences of their long-acting injectable cabotegravir experience um, in, a, in a large um, government clinic. Um, and they go ahead and have a nice chart where they outline all the roles and responsibility of everyone on the team and how they formulated their um, their process. In terms of our process, I wanted to go ahead and overlay it with an implementation science framework. Um, the CIFR, it's old, but I still love it. It's got five domains, and it really highlights the organizational level. So when you've got the consolidated framework for implementation research and its five domains, the first one that I'd like to highlight is the outer setting or your structural. So when you're thinking about this, and, and this is one of the really, you know, really important motivations for flying here and, and being here at 10 p.m. United States time was, was we really need to collectively work together to, to chip away at the policy. So when you look at the outer setting, the most two important things for us was what was our health law? And what did our health law allow us to do in terms of a non-licensed non professional who would be a nurse or above is a licensed professional, nurse, nurse practitioner, D, um, a DO or MD. But if you were not a licensed nurse, what could you do? So we saw that you could have on-site um, injections, intramuscular injections, large volume injections. Remember, these are not vaccines, which are um, 0.5 cc's. And then we wanted to also look farther ahead. We have home-based programs. So how can we do home-based um, HIV treatment with Repivirin and Cabotegravir when we've got people who are not suppressed? And so then we started also looking, I wanted to give you the framework for, for this particular setting, I'm going to specifically talk about PrEP, but I'm going to take you the thought processes of both um, HIV prevention and HIV treatment in order to, to you know, reach our, our goals overall of zero new infections. And so when you start looking at and thinking of policy, when you have um, off-site injections, you want to think about, am I going to have off-site injections through um, you know, independent administration or must I have supervision? And what is that supervision? Is that supervision, Dr. Patel has to be on the mobile van directly overseeing five medical assistants or five specialists, or can I do that through a televisit? So these are very important um, 
you know, terms and concepts when you look at policy, off-site, on-site injections, where is that supervision, and then again, also, what is the training that's required? Also, the FDA says this must be administered by a health provider. It must be shipped or dispensed by a pharmacist in the hand of a health provider or health provider office. So these are things we grappled with, and, um, you know, the prep specialist is part of our health team. And through the FDA interpretation for Whitman Walker and DC Health, they are part of our, our cadre of workers. Um, in terms of the inner setting, you can go ahead and see um, at the organizational level, we needed to tackle comfortability um, for injections by medical assistants and prep specialists. This is a ventral gluteal injection, not a dorsal gluteal injection. This is something new. We've done, never done it before. It's on, it's on the side um, of the thigh. When I say we haven't done it before, it's just not widely done. You know, the syphilis injections, um, the, the bicillin is given in the buttock. And then most of everything that we know from family planning to, um, to vaccines are in the arm. So we really had to work ahead on how to get comfortability in injecting in a landmark nobody was used to identifying and injecting, especially with the large volume. And then, um, you know, in terms of um, the people that were involved, so when we look at the individuals involved, we look at the characteristics of who we're delivering it to. And we, we know that a lot of people can't take their oral prep, but they're not really comfortable with needles. It's going to hurt me. Um, I'm not used to needles. You know, we, um, we also work with a population, um, young black MSM or Latino men who generally don't even access the healthcare system routinely and are not up to date for their vaccines. So there's very little sensitization to now a two month injection that's long um, in the buttocks or in the deep, um, in the deep intramuscular space. Um, our intervention characteristics, the downfall of this um, kind of evidence-based intervention, which is this cabotegravir injection, is that it's still every two months. It's not ideal. It's still very cumbersome. But the reason we were so invested to do this is because we need to lay out the foundation of implementation for the era that we're embarking in, which is the injectable era. And the injectable era is gonna give us subcutaneous injections every six months, maybe even every two and four months, even with cabotegravir when you look at the hot off the press data from Croy. And it's also gonna give us alternative sites. We're gonna have thigh injections, we're gonna have partner light injections and self injections. And then lastly, um, you know, the process we took was reiterative. So to go through the, to the list of the things that we did that I think will be lessons learned for everyone in general is we gathered insights from everybody um, from HPTN and people doing it around the United States. We called people up such as John and at Emory to understand how they were doing it. I went through the legal review that was very extensive. The pre-implementation period was one year for us because we had to talk to the legal team um, about intramuscular injections on and off site and by unlicensed professionals. Um, uh, we had new job hires and new descriptions. We developed a, a protocol and a workflow. Um, and then I'll go into the extensive program and training of the staff, laboratory specifics. Um, in the United States, we have billing and paperwork and medication acquisition issues that I think will be different for this geographic setting. The medical inventory is really important. Uh, the dashboard to create this intricate flow of inventory. Did you get the injection shipped before someone's appointment? And can you do that for over a thousand people? Right now our demand is around a thousand people because we have around 3,000 people who are PrEP users. Most of them actually want to try the injection. That doesn't mean that they'll stay on it, but a lot of them want to at least start in getting initiated to see if they would like to, to, um, for that to be as part of their PrEP journey. And then um, that database can also, that has to be real time and telling you how many injections there are and how many missed appointments, et cetera. And then for the United States, that is also tied to billing um, because we have to buy the $5,000 medication first, we administer it, and then we get that money back. Um, most cl um, clinics in America have lost at least $100,000 in this process to start up because they're not getting all the money back immediately. Um, and so now I'm going to go to um, move towards the um, residency style training that we did.
So basically the training we did um, over the next minute that I want to go over is we had um, two didactic lectures where we went over the guidelines, we talked about messaging, then we went into mock sessions, two mock sessions, about an hour and a half each, just to go over landmark identification. Um, and the training needed to be separated between how to create the vial and draw up the medication, and then how to find the landmark and administer it. Because I want to remind you, most of the peer specialists were used to, to oral prep. They didn't even know how to hold a syringe. Um, there was nervousness and even putting in the skin, having the large volume, seeing if the liquid was coming out, all the nuances of, um, of the injecting. Then we had in-clinic observation. That's what makes it medical residency style, I want to say. Um, so they came into clinic and went ahead and observed us um, every day, uh, multiple hours a day, um, in order to um, get a, 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 an understanding of, of the entire process with the patient. Everything from having a conversation to setting up the injection while the patient was watching you, and that patient might be really nervous seeing the needle, and then um, administering it, and then post-care, and then calls afterwards about that injection site reaction. We did videotape feedback review. We observed them um, in, in their own setting, um, in their own setup. And then we um, had a, a log of how many injections they did per month. We did group and one-on-one -on -one sessions. We had a survey. This is very important. We did a survey every month. And we went ahead. And at the beginning, on average, all five people had zero to um, two, zero, one, or two, in terms of on a scale of 10, in terms of their comfortability injecting. Overall, that increased and plateaued at eight, and this will happen everywhere because there was not enough comfort in the body sizes. When the BMI becomes greater than 35, it was very difficult for the prep spell specialists to feel comfortable that they accurately found the landmark. And so we did need to have their peer come in and double check. And I think that's important in terms of delivery, at least having a buddy system so there can be some cross-referencing and checking for the landmarks. Um, and then we, we created checklists in the pictures here. We, we created a spa-like environment. Come in, close your eyes, pretend you're on a beach. You don't even think about the needle. Um, we, want, we play spa music. This was really geared towards seven and eight. Um, young adults who'd never really interacted with the healthcare system. Um, you can see we had a nurse over there in the corner um, really going hands-on and, and teaching how to um, prepare the vial. You'll see all the different landmarks. We had the surgical marker, and it was almost like a dartboard where um, mar everybody was marking and then going ahead and um, injecting. And then the last bit is um, very detailed checklists and, and reviewing them almost like their homework assignments to go ahead and see if people had missed steps. We wanted them to have, have comfortability from memory. Um, here's more pictures of all the different really hands-on, residency-style, didactic, in-the-clinic um, uh, mock kind of walkthroughs. One thing, because, this, because under comfort, um, creating the vial has been now, and, and the injection has become very easy. Um, what's very important is um, the landmarks and figuring out the needle sizes and then counseling patients about that pain related to the needle size. Does someone who's really a BMI of 30, who might be my body type, really need a one and a half inch needle or do I need a one inch needle? And I think that's been coming up over and over as we have different um, body types in, in different communities. Cisgender women look different than the young gay population in DC. There's a case report that came out of Europe that's very important on a cabo um, cabotegra repilverine failure, um, even though there was not any mutations. And the CT scan showed that when they looked at the fat in front of the intramuscular space, there was a two inch at least um, uh, diameter or length of fat before you reach the two inch muscular space. I'm sorry, you, before you reach the intramuscular space. And this is relevant because this person's BMI was 27. So they were confused and they had a hunch that there was just differences in fat distribution and that's just general in life. We know like fat is distributed on different people differently. So they were very clever and decided very early on to get a CT scan to show that their two inch needle might actually, their one and a half inch needle as FDA approved may not 
actually work. And I think this is something as lessons learned for all of you that early on something I didn't do and I wish I had is gotten the funding for an ultrasound or something so that when I have um, kind of, you know, a hunch where there's differences in fat distribution, or we've got someone that has a BMI of 33, uh, not necessarily 39, what needle do I really need to use, the size, and am I actually reaching the intramuscular space? This is a publication in um, Open Forum Infectious Diseases. Um, just uh, in the next one minute, I'll be running over on my time for one to two minutes, moderators, just to give you a heads up. Um, but just in terms of the analysis, my main goal was to show you the implementation process and some of the lessons learned. In a nutshell, just proof of concept is um, we have 93 patients that were injected by community health workers. Um, and that was over um, 170 injections. So these are repeated injections now. And I repeat, we have 39 unique people, 170 independent injections. One third are black African American, which was the population we were trying to reach, which is a 12% increase than our regular clinic. Um, and we have reached Ward 7 by over 13%. That is where our number of new infections are the highest. And then in terms of the treatment side, 103 people have been injected. Injected, um, over 114, um, uh, sorry, 416 injections. So 103 unique people, 416 independent injections by what we consider as non-licensed professionals. Our, we are using the um, protocol that Monica Gandhi put out at UCSF, which is for unsuppressed. With that, our viral load suppression um, is 96% compared to 84% when you compare our Cabanuva patients versus our oral ARV patients. And 44% are getting monthly, 56% are getting every two months. And our compliance is similar at, at two different sites what they have. So we showed a little bit of reproducibility and what was mentioned earlier, fidelity to the protocol with great outcomes. And then in general, we gave surveys. Our surveys were essentially looking at um, what did you want in terms of satisfaction and how would you describe that? And now we're turning our survey content. I don't, for the sake of time, I don't want to go into the detail of the words. But what's important is now we have a cadre of individuals that have experience with the injections. And now we're going to get messaging from them to make our grinder, uh, you know, and other type of social media um, ads. Um, and in general, um, you know, this bodes into... Um, in a minute, I just want to talk about the models for task shifting. You know, there are very little, there are few metrics in the injectable ARV space in terms of community health workers, training, et cetera. But we can take lessons learned from other models, which um, in, in South Asia were related to TB, family planning, newborn care, rural paramedic skilled birth attendants. In the United States framework, we're looking at policy related to pharmacists, um, related to um, opioids, um, gender affirming hormones, et cetera. And so um, in general, these three um, papers just show that in, in the 1970s, they did tubectomy by community health workers, and that was equivalent to, um, the rates were equivalent to um, trained, licensed doctors. And then in Bangladesh, they also showed injectable antibiotics by community health workers um, in newborns that were severely ill. And that worked as well in terms of quality and competency and improved outcomes. And also TB had higher cure rates with community health workers. In terms of some of the legislation we talked about is, um, you know, I think it's who delivers it and what's the on-site and off-site um, uh, you know, uh, supervision with that. And the last slide had a little bit of the terminology and I can talk to anyone offline who wants the terminology for legislation. So in summary, there's a peer worker injectable program that was demonstrated to be feasible and was received well in Washington, DC. And in, in general, we should all come together as advocates for long-term policies that enable task shifting for injectable therapies so we can scale up. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm gonna turn it over to the moderators.